uh, specifically in the mobile era. We have a couple of world-renowned journalists joining us today. Specifically, we have Ben Rooney. We'll start him off. I should have started ladies first, but Ben. <laughs> ben is a uh, is the former European tech editor for the Wall Street Journal and current the co-editor in chief for Informilo. Informilo is actually the the company that was generous enough to do the print magazine. Uh, this gentleman, stage right, is looking at uh, right now. And next up, we have Jennifer Riggins. Jennifer, please join me on stage. Hello. Jennifer is an American journalist currently living in Barcelona, and she writes for CBS Interactive's Smart Planet. They uh, they cover global innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and you know are always always redefining uh, different topics in innovation. And last but not least, we have Robin Waters. Robin's no stranger to Barcelona. Robin is the former European editor of The Next Web, a former senior writer of TechCrunch, and now uh, currently branching off on his own as the founder of TechEU. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Just to give a premise of the, today's talk, again, this is very open, very honest, very safe environment. Please feel free to ask questions, interrupt us. Uh, we're going to discuss what we feel is the future of journalism. I mean, this is a journalism and mass communication is an industry that's been upended and disrupted for the past 15 years. And a lot of, you know, the, the big names that were here 10 or 20 years ago either no longer exist or have been completely transformed into new entities. So we're here to kind of break down why, what it looks like today, and, and more importantly, what, what it's going to look like tomorrow. Uh, so without, without further ado, uh, we'll start here with... Um, Kind of an open question just on how has the way that we as society changed in the way that we consume news and get our information, especially with the prolifer proliferation of the smartphone? Ben, did you want to maybe start us off? The, um, I suppose the biggest difference that we have is um, the instant nature of communication that we have today. So if we take events that are taking place in Maidan Square in, 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 in Kiev, um, we were, you know, we as in the greater world was able to share those events at exactly the same time as they were happening on the ground. Um, and now that's for better or worse. So, and that, we've seen that uh, experience uh, of getting closer and closer and closer to immediacy is something that's, that's, that's happened as technology has improved. So if you go back, you know, 100 years, probably the single greatest invention for the news, news business was the invention of the telegraph. Um, before the invention of the telegraph, it took about nine months for a message to go from London to India and then back again. After the invention of the telegraph, that was about four minutes. And, we've, and it's taken us now to get from four minutes to instant. So that is the, it's, it's that sense of immediacy, that sense, that, that old adage about how news will find you, you don't have to go looking for news. Uh, and that has finally come true. News now will find you, whatever you do. That's a very, uh, that's a great thing in some ways. It's also a very dangerous thing. Um, and that gives journalists uh, and the whole media industry now has an even greater responsibility than it had before, which is it has to try and help its users, its readers, its viewers to establish in this huge amount of noise what is true and what is not true. Um, and that's, a, that's a, an enormous responsibility. Sure. Sure. And what's important and what's not important. Exactly. I kind of want to ask the crowd something. Who is optimistic and confident in news today? Raise your hand if you believe that news is headed in a good direction, a positive direction. Well, don't all okay. rush. Okay. <laughs> don't all, hopefully people are just not texting. And well, how many people are worried about the direction news is going? <laughs> what's the, their worry? What, I think. What's the, anyone, what's your biggest worry? That's a great question. Yeah. Yell it out. Wait. Oh, wait. Yeah, this guy here? Yeah. You have to be near the microphone. Oh. Sorry, I can take that. <laughs> Sorry. I, I no, please. Uh, I guess, uh, from my perspective at least, 
I think that the things that get published are more optimized to this, this short term, like very, you know, uh, basic uh, sensational stuff. Got it. And I guess that uh, that's what's worrying me because sometimes the truth is not sensational and the things that are educating are not sensational. Good point. And, uh, and, and, and that's what's taking the mind share. 10 mm -hmm. things to get, <laughs> like most articles today are like 10 things. Nah. Yeah. 10 yeah. things <laughs> to know yeah, seriously. before going to <laughs> four years from now. Yeah. <laughs> so is it Google's fault? Is it Google's fault that our news is crap now, for no. lack of a more eloquent way to say it? Google decides what is valuable to us, right? So is it the responsibility of Google to now decide what's important or not? I think Would Google played a role a few years ago. I think social media has a bigger role to play now. I was just going to say, yeah. The whole viral nature of Facebook, Twitter changed the way that news is being presented and packaged. And I think that it kind of trains users what to expect from certain publications. But it also opens up a whole new world of digital media or startups like Upworthy and BuzzFeed and Business Insider catering to the audience. So it's not just you know, journalists and, or journalists doing things that cause people to have shorter attention spans. It's the platforms change, the expectations of the audience change, society as a whole changes. So, so you kind of go along with the flow, I guess. It's not, it's not like cause and effect. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, it's definitely a synthetic. I wish I, like I, what I, I, I don't think the journalists are to blame. I think it's actually human nature. That hmm. it's like sugar. I do think that some we journalists love sugar are to blame. and we get addicted <laughs> to it, but it's not healthy for us. Just for yeah. the record, some journalists are to blame. I'm just saying, if you generalize, then you know, Certainly. you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. You're or not going to get any answers. Journalists, maybe. But it is. It's it's demand-driven content. So so if if we're competing for clicks, the the natural order, the next step, and and the slippery slope to what's to where we're riding right now is that. We're writing these sensationalist headlines and these, yeah, these lists and these numbers that, that we know are scientifically kind of data driven to get more clicks, get more eyeballs, because we're, we're based on advertising. And so we want to get as many eyeballs as possible. So, um, you know, it's something actually. Uh, do we have one other question? Yeah. Right here? This guy over here is talking about what worries him. Can you yell? Yeah. Okay. I want to know like, what you guys think about Vice Media. Uh, are they playing like, an important role, like how the news is going to be presented in the future? Or do you not Vice? You think about it? Yeah, Vice Media. Well, Vice is pioneering a lot of uh, ways to experience journalism, not even just to do journalism, to how to experience and consume it. So I think, yeah, they will play a pivotal role in how news will be presented in the next three, five years. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting question. There are platforms sprouting up that, that like Robin said, are, are changing the way that we interact and that we, that we find our news and, and read about the brands we love and the, and the, the news we want to find. And, and some of them, yeah, like Vice and, and what, Quartz is another one that's kind of, you know, uh, focusing a little bit more on long-form journalism um, that, that do kind of appear as hope that we're not just, you know, racing to zero, like Ben was saying, with, with our instant consumption uh, of this watered down kind of content. I, um, but I'm going to jump in there because I'm not completely convinced by this argument. Because after all, if you look at a, um, let's go back, let's go back uh, um, 20 years and look at the newspaper landscape in 20 years. You know, you talk about 10 things you never knew about. Okay, I, you know, I spent a large amount of my life in British newspapers. And just for the record, in case anyone's listening, I've never hacked your phone, okay? <laughs> I, ne I know how to do it, I just never did it. Um, but we had newspapers there, the Sun newspaper, um, endlessly running, you know, 10 things you never knew about whatever. If you look, uh, uh, and, and at the same time as we had 10 things you never knew about, I don't know, Abraham Grant, um, we also had, you know, the Financial Times doing, you know, LIBOR scandals, and we had, you know, The Guardian doing whatever things that The Guardian does and misspelling it. Um, so, you know, there's always been a rich media landscape that it has existed. So I'm not completely convinced by the argument that the internet is this, is this path to hell of, of 
you know, that basically the entire newspaper, the entire media landscape is going to end up looking like Mashable. Um, I would say, I have to be careful here because I, I, I only very recently left the Wall Street Journal, um, but I was slightly depressed to see just after I, I left the journal that even the Wall Street Journal has just launched a, 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 a series called Five Things About, um, you know, what, and you think, God, if it's, if it's reached the Wall Street Journal, we're all in trouble. Um, but no, I don't think it's necessary to be that gloomy because, as you say, Quartz, you know, is doing some fantastic stuff. Quartz is, a, Quartz is an amazing product, um, really intelligent journalism. Um, I, I think there's a lot of really good stuff happening. I, I'm very bullish. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so do we agree? Do we agree that there is reason for optimism or does the fact that a website like Google or the running of the world decides that people like lists, people like digestible content more, that these L beautiful long form will die out. Google Let's just agree that there's always reasons for optimism in any okay. situation, any point in time, because otherwise, you know. So whose responsibility <laughs> is it? <laughs> Sorry? Is it the journalist's responsibility? Is it the it's publisher's? It's the whole ecosystem. It's the whole society, the whole mm -hmm. world. Everyone plays a role, so, you know. They're very interdependent, so you can't just... You can't blame anyone, and you can't ask anyone to fix it. It's going to be like a, you so know, no a one joint effort. It. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Well, it's on the, it's on the, you know, it's on the burden of us as consumers and, and society to demand better, better journalism and, and better storytelling uh, fr from the media industry. And at the same time, it's it's on us to, to come up with new ways and new business models to to tell those stories and share that news that hopefully also finds a groove with with mass, you know, mass culture and, and mass society. And, and we're seeing some of that pop up. We're seeing some pushback. Um, actually, Robin right here is, is leading the charge in Europe with, with tech.eu. And maybe actually you could speak a little bit about what made you, yeah. you know, open, open that. N so so that obviously I'm a little biased here, but um, what we're trying to do at tech.eu is, is not fix technology journalism as a whole, but, but we see this, this watering down of the the news coverage in technology in general, especially um, in the U.S., and we kind of, as a as a counter effort, if you will, uh, we started we started the site called Tech.eu. It's been live for three months only, so we're very young. Uh, but we're trying to bring a little bit more substance, go a little deeper, uh, do more analysis, research, and a little bit more long form. Although I don't really like the term long form, I prefer uh, you know unique content, perspective, exactly. context, better terms. I think. Um, and we'll see if there's an appetite for it. And if there isn't, then it's not a failure on our part necessarily, or on the audience's part, it's a symbiosis, right? But uh, we'll see if there's an appetite. So far, the signs are promising, but we'll see. Um, yeah, and, and so, far, so far, how have you found the, the reception of, of your new endeavor, your new venture, and, and how has it been welcomed? Because you're, you're, you've been around you know, some years now in the European tech, especially the tech ecosystem, so you're very well known across y the you know, European landscape. How have you been welcomed with Tech EU? I mean, has it been a, a well, warm welcome? If, if you tell people what you're doing, everyone's going, oh, great, finally. <laughs> but then you can't force anyone to read it and to keep coming back. So you still have to earn their trust and their attention every single day. So it's a lot of work. And it's going to continue to be a lot of work, and it's going to be hard work. But you know, someone, I think, needs to do it. And if it's us, then fine. If it's more than just us, then you know, even better. Uh, we welcome all competition. If it goes to, as long as there's unique perspective being brought by you know, any publication, I welcome it. What I don't welcome is all the watering down and the listicles and the, you know, I'm kind of against it as well. But yeah. how do you compete against those? How do you compete against the Huffington well, Post? Well, you don't, <laughs> because you can't. They have more resources. They go for an audience. You, you, they go for the eyeballs. If you say we're going for quality, then you know you're never, never going to compete for the same amount of eyeballs. It's just you know, it's never going to happen. So you find new ways to monetize. You find new ways um, to generate revenue in other uh, from other sources, and then that kind of innovation can help even traditional media figure out new ways to, to make money. So it's like you know it's a circle mm -hmm. circle of life. It's not it could have saved New York Times. Who knows? Maybe we might end up buying still, them at some point. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, the, answer, the, the answer is you go deep. I mean, you, the, the, problem, the problem in the media business at the moment is that um, the basic structure of the media industry has been, was probably one of the first industries to be disrupted. Um, if you think about the newspaper, how, what was a newspaper? Um, 
the newspaper was, you know, the, the theory of the newspaper was, to the reader, was um, you buy the newspaper, you come, come for the crossword and stay for the war crime. So you, you know, here is this really great crossword which you like, and once you've done the crossword, then you flick through and you know, oh look, here's this really interesting story about a war crime. Um, nobody buys newspapers to read about war crimes, or very few people. So it was a bundle, but of course what the internet was able to do was to completely destroy that bundle. Um, and, and if you were interested in, in crosswords, you went and got a crossword, and when you finished that crossword, you went and got another crossword. You didn't read anything else. And the, the whole business was sold around selling advertisers, selling your readers to advertisers. I mean, that's all we were. The reality was, if you worked in a newspaper, you were the stuff that went around the advertisements, <laughs> from a business point of view. From the reader's point of view, you, what you actually were was trust. We didn't sell news, we sold trust. The problem is, in the modern industry, in, in, since the introduction of the internet, and even more so now with mobile and the speed of mobile, that ability has gone. Um, so you have to work twice as hard to deliver trust. And the way you do that is, is, is by going deep, not by going wide. So general interest newspapers are going to find life very difficult indeed. It's very difficult to monetize in, in, in what in newspaper terms was called cat up tree stories. So if you write a story about a cat up a tree, it's very difficult to monetize that. You know, if you write stories about as Robin does, goes in, going into detail on the European technology scene, mm -hmm. uh, the Wall Street Journal going into really detailed analysis on financial scandals, that has value. And, and in the journal's case, you can sell it directly, and in Robin's case, he will find other ways of monetizing it. So I think the future for journalism is narrow but deep. Um, and I think it's going to be very hard indeed for anyone who is trying to be all things to all people. That's and really hard. it's hard to break into and it's hard to make a change. It's something that even as I keep talking about Google, one thing Google's doing very well is creating Google authorship, the sense of responsibility and credibility that someone like I have the highest personally for Spain entrepreneurship. I have extremely high credibility in just this very specific area, which I love right now, but five, 10 years from now, I can't really make a change, and the next generation of journalists is going to be in trouble. When you have kids, you should automatically register their Twitter. You should automatically be using their Google Plus, doing things that will help their SEO in the future, potentially, <laughs> because it's limited real estate. But if they want to be able to do anything, they need it now, but there is a limited real estate in the internet, so people will become very focused on one thing. But I think that leads, it's good for now, but in a couple of years, no one's going to be new, and eventually, t two generations from now, people are going to die off. Sure. So that's a problem that people are, and even in that way, yes, you get to, there's wonderful sites that help you find the news you want, but then you're not finding the other side. It's basically the internet news is becoming what TV in America has been. I only watch CNN or MSNBC. I'm not going to watch Fox. My dad's only going to watch Fox News. We're not getting each other's type of news. We're not learning the other side. So you become more polarized, which is the risk. Yeah. This is very serious. Yeah. You may actually came up with two main things I want, I want to speak on there. And, but one, kind of backing up just a little bit, if we are going the deep dive route and, and you know, we're going to create a, an army of experts in all these very niche, niche areas, the way you build trust is by sticking around, right? And, and, and repeatedly offering value to your audience and, and really if you can stick it out, you know, you, it, that grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. But that begs the question, okay, well, how do you stick around? How do, you, how do you make enough money to be sustainable, right? And so if we're not competing for eyeballs, which equals dollar signs, how are we sticking around? How are we staying sustainable? So we're seeing a couple new models pop up. Um, specifically, actually, the, the one that I have top of mind right now is uh, the information in Silicon Valley, which is a subscription-based model. Uh, you know, how do we think about these types of ventures, which are actually asking their readers themselves to fork over some money to be, have access to this content? Is this a is this a sustainable model? Yeah. And and you, you say some case? money, but they charge forty four hundred dollars a year. Yeah, yeah it's almost forty per month. Year. So if you pay per year, it's four hundred dollars, which is significant amount of a cash. A lot of money. Yeah. Um, so but then again, they only need about three thousand subscribers. 
to sustain a staff of like five, six supporters, mm -hmm. which is sizable. I mean, and they're, you know, no income from advertising, sponsored research, events, nothing. Just that they don't need a, a huge audience. So it might, it might just work, by the way. Um, but it's interesting that you touch on that because um, y this whole trend of entrepreneurial journalism, as I call it, I'm, I'm a very small example. There are loads more examples in the US. Um, Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg doing her own thing. Um, Jessica Lesson starting the information. Um, Glenn Greenwald starting First Look Media. Um, notice how they all have investors. And that means two things, right? There's a renewed interest in media from uh, not just you know the, your typical investor, the VCs or angel investors, but also from people like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post. So that's a, mm -hmm. a trend that I think will continue if that keeps on going the way that it does, like the amounts get bigger. I think Vox Media raised 70 million on its own. Uh, 70 million dollars for you know essentially a bunch of gadgets and tech news sites. Renewed investor interest pulls in more established journalists will leave their magazines and you know newspapers to go out on their own, to break out on their own. Um, so I, there's hang on, I mean, I mean Jeff Bezos, uh, let's be honest here. I mean, news, you know, media companies have always been the property of rich white guys. <laughs> um, every <laughs> major news corporation in the world so is for Ariana Huffington. Yeah, yeah. yeah with, with her, possibly the notable exception, um, <laughs> are owned by, uh, you know, they're the playthings of rich people. Um, you know, Rupert Murdoch owns vast tracts of, 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 of the newspaper industry. But he has a political agenda in that. Yeah, but that's, yeah. <laughs> Clearly what, does. and you think Jeff Bezos doesn't? Do you uh, think it could be him giving you think back Glenn, in You think a way? Glenn Greenwald doesn't have a political <laughs> agenda? <laughs> okay. I mean, I think there's a huge, you know, Conrad Black was a huge newspaper owner. Um, you know, the media has always been owned by rich people um, because it buys them power and influence. It's always been the case, with the exception of national, with the exception of obviously state media. And then you end up in a very peculiar situation <laughs> where you have state media. Which There's is nothing like, besides BBC that's worth watching. Yeah, which is a kind of weird <laughs> idea anyway. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's always been that way. I think it's great that there are these investors and long may they come in. But let's be real about it. You know, they have an agenda. And, and if, you don't, if you think they don't have an agenda, you're naive. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So it's multimillionaire versus pay-per-click, multimillionaire long-form adequate quality pizzas and pay-per-click crap that's easily consumable that you can eat in a minute, like a mic paper online. Wow. So it's, this is the big area, democracy versus idiocracy. I don't know if this was really popular in Spain, but there was a movie maybe 10 years ago by the creator of Beavis and Butthead, already giving a lot of quality, called Idiocracy. Mediocre movie, I love Beavis but and Butthead, come <laughs> yeah, on. That's okay. Don't say that. <laughs> I love that. But Idiocracy was... <laughs> Not a great movie, but a wonderful premise. And it's basically that as society grows larger and larger, smart people are waiting to have children, and then dumb people <laughs> are having more and more children, and eventually idiots run the world. Well, if that is basically a very logical idea, could that happen to the internet? Is that happening to news? So it's basically you need these rich investors to invest in long-form quality journalism that's autonomous from governments and potentially autonomous from business, as well, we shall see, or you have this Huffington Post, Mashable, just mashed, Mashable is in its name, it's just mashing ideas together and wants you to consume things as quickly as possible. So, do you Both think can coexist, I, I, I agree. I, and I did, I, I mentioned BuzzFeed myself, but look at BuzzFeed and what it is, and you will find a lot of quality journalism on BuzzFeed. But you so, also find a lot, it's you know, and they both. coexist. They have the listicles, and then they have quality journalism. Mm -hmm. If they, you know, if they might have to like create separate brands over time, who knows? But for mm -hmm. now, you can find both on there. So on that side, so it is possible. A rarity, though, I would say. It is possible. If they can yeah. prove that it works, then maybe others will follow. Who knows? But why are we moving in two directions? Why aren't we moving to a balance more? Like I think BuzzFeed's an excellent but rare example. Well, even Medium, which, which is supposed to have maybe more of an altruistic uh, <laughs> vision than the BuzzFeeds and the Upward. These, but, but Medium has some amazing content by, by very uh, credible journalists right alongside mm -hmm. some not so amazing content. Uh, so, I mean, I think, I think we are seeing that, that coexist, and I think a lot of it is still in, in formation, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you brought up an interesting point about uh, mixing 
the business, uh, you know, businesses and, and journalism. And Robin, you said that you're going to see more and more journalists strike out on their own uh, or leave the the former industry giants, right? I mean, we're actually we're we're sitting with with a few right here. Uh, two here. But is that because there aren't jobs? Uh, but what we're also seeing is a trend of brands scooping up these journalists too. And, and you know, I think recently we saw Katie Couric uh, leaves CBS to go to to go to Yahoo. And David Pope. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, what what's the motive with brands uh, buying up these journalists, buying up these 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 storytellers per se? The motive is that the journalist has to become the brand. I mean, the, the, you know, Andrew Sullivan was the first person to really attempt this with a you know, reasonable degree of success. Of, of, and the real test is, and it's the test that both Robin and I are you know, facing at the moment, Betting is up. can you bring your readership with you? Can you bring your audience? You know, if, you're, if, you, if you establish your audience in one place and you move, does that audience come with you? Um, or does that audience actually go, no, we only liked you because you actually work for them. Or they don't uh, know you moved. Yeah, exactly. Oh, they have no That's clue who you are, which is theory. probably you know, closer to the truth. Um, and that's going to be the real test. But social media is very important in this. Social media actually allows you to establish yourself as a brand. It actually gives you a, a presence, a, you know, a, a voice, which just wasn't possible before. I mean, there was no way of doing it. Before that, the only people who cared of, on your, about your byline was you and your mum. <laughs> Nobody else cares. So. But then how do people join the marketplace? I see it as something really great for us now because we have so many followers or we're active on Google Plus or anything, which no one's actually active on Google Plus, but we all know it's important so to pretend to be acti active on Google Plus. But yeah. <laughs> Phrases but you never hear. Yeah. <laughs> Active on Google Plus. <laughs> but everyone wants to look like they're active on Google Plus because it has more power than any other. Um, but how do you enter the market well, without joining the... By making a noise, by being good. By yeah. I mean, I just this, this idea that we're in some sort of dystopian future of journalism I think is wrong, and I, I, I really want to get away from this. And I also want to get away from this idea that these are dark times because there's a certain amount of elitism in all of this as well. There's a certain amount of that we don't like, you know, that, 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 that journalists have been used to controlling the argument and used to controlling the message and being in charge. And, you know, I, I launched, uh, I, showing my, my great age, I launched um, Europe's first daily newspaper online, which was the Daily Telegraph, uh, in November 1994. So we, we, we're coming up for an anniversary. And I remember on the first day, if I was a lot smarter, I would have worked out the entire future of journalism on day one, because it was all there for us to see. So on day one, we ran some story about some political story. I can't even remember what it was. And we got all these emails coming in. And, uh, and it was sort of like, you know, who do, why should we believe what this, you know, the political editor said? And you go, why should you believe what the because he's the political editor of the Daily Telegraph, that's why. And you should, not only should you believe what he says, you should be thankful, and tomorrow you can come, and he'll tell you what to think tomorrow. And that was what we were used to doing. And now, all of a sudden, and this is very hard for the journalism business, there are people who've got equally good points, people who's, who's value, who's, who you may not share your views, your opinions, but they're perfectly entitled to those opinions, and they've now got a voice. And there are some pretty horrible sites out there. I mean, you mentioned Fox News, you know. Um, I can say that, I no longer work for Rupert anymore. Fox <laughs> News is a horrible place. Um, but there it is, and they're entitled to their view. And we can't be elitist about it. Fair enough. I think we should go to the audience, to yeah. stop being elitist. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well before we, we jump into the Q&A, and we'll, we'll definitely take questions from the audience, um, since this is, uh, an event for entrepreneurs, right? It's, it's for mobile entrepreneurs. How can, how can we as entrepreneurs and as, as emerging brands, I guess, build our, build our brand and, and find our audience with these new channels? Uh, are, there any, are there any specific uh, pieces of advice you could offer or, uh, or typical questions you're receiving from, uh, from brands trying to reach you or use, use your medium or your channel to build their brand? Do everything Matt Cutts says 
change everything when he says it. Google's SEO wonderment. He's the most powerful person in branding. Sad with Care to add? <laughs> going to defer to Ben for that one. On brand, how, what, what, just what was the question? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. So how can, I mean, as, as up and coming entrepreneurs, how can we use the, the, this dynamic media landscape to, to our own benefit? How can we build our brand when you don't really know what tomorrow's gonna bring? You mean how do startups do it? How, how, do, how can startups build a brand? By using the media? Right. By getting their story out there, by, by telling their, their story. I mean, you know, journal, good journalism is about, is, is about people. That's what people really want to read. They want to read stories about other people. That's what, you know, there's this great thing in, in war reporting. If you, cover, if, you, if you cover war stories, you know, tell the story of the soldier, don't tell the story of the battle. Um, you know, so if they, as a, as a writer, you're absolutely, you know, it, those are the stories you want. How did whoever it was, you know, overcome adversity? How did they do all these things? Just tell really, really good stories. If you are the third biggest Groupon clone in Barcelona, um, frankly, nobody cares. Um, unless you've got some unbelievable tale of how you became, that you, I don't know, you, I can't even begin to think how unbelievable your story would have to be. Um, so you've got to tell a story. And that's, it's the oldest, it's the, the oldest form of communication uh, in mankind, is can you tell a story? Um, it predates the written word. Mm -hmm. So nothing ever changes. And then things that have changed is not only are we deciding, journalists aren't the only ones deciding, it's your turn to ask questions. You don't get to decide as much anymore what your audience is. You need to be asking questions on Twitter, on Facebook. Use these social media. Encourage to have an active blog community that uh, that's just commenting on things and all. That's the only way you're going to learn about your clients is to ask questions and get feedback because that's what steers your product. You may have a vision as a startup entrepreneur, but who your clients are really will steer your vision, so you need to work to build a community. That's the only way to build your brand's focus and name, because then there's a wonderful presentation about this going on right in this dome right now about that, but it's about creating a mutual story and making these people brand, ad, brand ambassadors that are so enthusiastic about your product and feel a part of it and feel like they have a voice. Yeah. So you gotta start asking questions. Yeah, so, so I regularly, well, occasionally do workshops for um, startups to tell them how they should deal with media, etc. cetera. Um, usually it's like a half an hour, I'll boil it down to three. Um, one, storytelling, but I'll start with the first one, is do something amazing, which a lot of people uh, forget. Like they'll reach out without you know, having some, something, built something meaningful or innovative, or if you reach out to a technology journalist and your technology isn't impressive, or what you're doing with it isn't impressive, then you know, you're not gonna get anywhere. Next is learning how journalists work. You know, read them, uh, interact with them on Twitter or Facebook, whatever. Um, learn their audience, learn what, they, what their beat is, learn what they like to write about, and then reach out and have a good story to tell. And you know, take it from there, but do all the homework before you do that. Or okay. depressingly, get a celebrity to... Uh, um, that doesn't work with me, man. It doesn't it work with credibility. <laughs> Ce celebrity but stories. Honestly, like star stars Kim will Kardashian's come up. Kardashian's butt doesn't help in the tech community. Get a celebrity endorsement. So startups will come up to me and ask the silliest questions like, should I do a press release or a blog post? Or should I send uh, my press release on Tuesday or is Monday evening better? And I go like, I don't know, what's your story? What, what are you building? Mm -hmm. Like start with that, right? Do something cool and amazing and build an innovative company and then you know, we can talk about all the details, but you know, get that out of the way first. And know your competitors, because there's always going to be ones, and you have to stand up differently. I work for two startups. One's Quote Roller, the biggest business proposal app in the country or in the world. But now, we've created this new document electronic signature app. I was just at the regular Mobile World Congress. Out of the maybe 45, 50 Catalan companies there, three were electronic signature apps. You're not going to, we're not going to stand out as PandaDoc because of our ability to sign signatures. Yes, it's legal, everyone knows now, people are using it. We have to stand out because we have the message of PandaDoc. We're giving 1% to save the panda. We choose 
there's a relationship. We have to choose to tell the story of our company, not about the technology as much. People don't care. Electronic signatures are really boring, so I have to work hard to help us build a different marketing strategy. And you have to look at your competitors and figure, well, their mar marketing is boring too. What can you do to stand out and be memorable? So embrace these new channels. Embrace them as they come up, because they're going to keep coming. That's one truth I think we can all agree on, is that technology will always change. I think this year we're going to see the rise of Google Glass. I even saw some people walking around here with it. Um, but, but the fundamentals don't change. You know, tell your story, be creative. As Robin said, be amazing. Give us something to write about. Give us, give us motivation. You know, give us something that, that we think that our audience will care about. Uh, so we have a, a, a few minutes left here. We'd love to open it up to you guys. And if you have any, any questions uh, regarding the future of journalism or anything regarding even your startups or, or any uh, questions or comments you have, please, uh, we have a, a microphone here, one right up front. Okay. <laughs> You're very comfortable. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, guys. Um, so from what you've been saying, it seems like now that news isn't just packaged and sold to people, then a reader has to be a lot more discerning on how they're doing it because they have to go and follow these people or read all these individual blogs that you guys are all starting up. So does this mean for your strategy, um, especially the two of you who've gone out on your own, that you're no longer going for quantity? Like, do you think it's you can have a sustainable strategy just based on a small number of like really discerning readers, like I suppose the financial markets, and you not particularly bothered by all the other people who are not going to read your really good but long pieces? I think that's exactly what's happening. Well, that's what we, what we hope, at least. But the future will prove that. I mean, time will tell. We, I, I don't know if it's going to be sustainable long term. Our business, I don't know if his business is going to be sustainable long term. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. That, that's what I said in the beginning. We'll have to see if there's an appetite for quality and enough appetite to actually monetize it efficiently and scale it. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I mean, there was turns, turns out on that. There was a, a very good case of this, which was um, the Times newspaper in London um, basically shut itself completely off the internet. So it's, it's, it's got an absolute firewall. It doesn't even appear in Google searches. Um, and it only goes to subscriber content. And their philosophy was that it was better to have 100,000 paid subscribers who will engage directly with that than who will spend three, four, five minutes on the site or on the app than, you know, however many million they come in, they flit around and they go and you don't know anything about them. They're very uh, quiet about their actual figures, but they will tell you that the model is working. They won't tell you how well it's working, but they do claim that model is working. If it does work, then that will be a very interesting statement because it, it will be the proof that actually, yes, it is better to have fewer engaged readers than you know millions of people who just kind of come in and flit around and go go away that's but what we'll find out with the information but then on a bigger picture level are you worried about what that means for society as in if you can't pay this 400 pounds or whatever the firewall oh. times is more like a couple of pounds a month then if you're just a normal person you don't then get any access to good information at all it's terrifying <laughs> but, but, but journalism is, is is in journalism has always been a very curious thing which is it's a public good, but it's a private, it's, it's, it's a privately provided public good. And that's all, it's, it's, it's really like no other product in the world. Um, most public goods are public goods. They're provided by, you know, gen generally provided publicly. So it's always had this very strange position. I do think you're right. I do think you're right to touch on one thing, and that there is a very worrying future. And one of the most dangerous things that Google has done is personalized search. Because what that means is the search term, the, the results that I get, if I'm logged in, I will get different search terms to you. I get different, sorry, different results. So now my vision of the world, which is based on what Google knows about me, is different to your vision of the world based on what Google knows about you. So we are actually separating. And you can go onto any number of sites Let's take a really controversial topic like global warming. Go onto a global warming site, which is either pro or against, and you are in a religious environment. That is, we are not in science, we're not in debate, we're in religion. Um, and that is very, very frightening. 
the world is getting further apart now. Good point. I, I hear so many startups come up with a, yeah, we're going to do personalized news based on your Twitter and Facebook feed. Yeah, you know, we're going to filter and curate for you and tell you this is the stuff you should be reading based on what your friends are reading and your history of reading. And I'm thinking, why the hell would I want you to do that? Like, why wouldn't I be, want to be surprised or just be caught off guard by an article that I might, may, might not have read if yeah. you weren't there to curate it for me? And there are so many of them, and you keep trying, and I keep thinking, you know, the, the world should be going in the opposite direction. Think so, of so how agree. boring conversations will be. Don't you think maybe nowadays, as we have classes and everything, maybe news consumption should be a class in school? I think it's really logical how to get news, how to consume it and understand it. But how, how to assess information. <laughs> so critical how to assess thinking information. is essential, and I yeah. see it a lot as a topic of a problem in the entrepreneurial community in Spain, certainly, is that you're not taught in school to debate. You're not taught critical thinking. You're taught to devour information and spit it back up. And this, the most important thing is taught. Even doing debate in school would help people learn if they have to public speak in school and debate, then they'd actually have to learn to consume information differently and they'd learn to read the news better. What else do we got? Questions? I think we have time for one more, if there's any other questions. Or things you want to complain about in the news <laughs> world, or maybe you disagree about with us. us it's me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, as, a, as a startup founder, I'm really inspired by companies like Buffer and Intercom that have used uh, their blogs to tell stories and to educate. Uh, I mean, I'm really a fan of both companies, right. and I met them first because of their content. So now, um, when I'm raising money, part of my budget is actually to hire journalists. Um, yes. So I, I've got a question. We like that. Yeah. I've got a question <laughs> for you guys because I guess you guys have hired journalists or have who understand. Like I know how to hire technical guys. How would you? What are the? What is like the top three questions? Or wh how do you? What's the process you use to assess if someone is a, is a great storyteller? Because I think Buffer and Intercom has showed that it's not just to be a curator. You need to be someone that has the okay. punch. Good ask question. Them to pitch ideas. question. Yeah, ask them straight up to pitch yeah. ideas. Say, what do you think our readers want to hear about? That's how I got my job for my two startups. And yeah. there were many, many people. And you just want to see what they would want to write. And you have to think and run it by your readers. Yeah. Your it's, it, it's, it's, yeah it's, it, journalism is the last remaining, one of the last remaining, uh, uh, I was going to say professions. It's not a profession. One of the last Profession? remaining jobs where it doesn't matter when I interview uh, a journalist, I don't care what, if I'm looking to recruit, I don't care what degree, where they went to university, I don't care what degree they, I don't even look at their education. There's only one thing that I ever look at, which is I would want to see stuff that they have written, and then I want exactly that. I want to ask them some ideas. You know, I have hired, in terms of uh, journalists, I've used, I used a, a guy, I, used to, I didn't even know how, how old he was. It turned out he was 85. Um, I, I only ever, you know, we only ever corresponded over by email or over the phone. I was thought he sounded a bit old. Turned out he was 85, this guy. I had no idea. Other end, I, I recruited a guy who was writing for Britain's uh, uh, most, uh, uh, successful, uh, most uh, uh, successful quality newspaper, the Daily Telegraph. He was 16. I only found out he was 16 when I had to phone him up to find out um, there was a question on his copy. I phoned him up and this woman answered. And I said, you know, who is this? And, and, and I said, can I speak to so-and-so? And she said, no, he's not here. He's, he's up at the college. And there was just something about the way she said And I said, can I ask what he, you know, is he a lecturer there? And she went, oh, no, 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 he's at school. <laughs> and I was like, oh, um, you never mentioned that. None of that matters. Do they, can they write, mm -hmm. and actually, can they write, and do they have really, really good ideas? Do they have ways of tackling ideas that you think, wow, I would never have thought of that. Because if they just come up with what you would have thought of, do it yourself. You'll be cheaper. And it's the most democratic hiring Listen process probably man. ever. Listen Using to Elance or Odesk, it's you just, you have no bias. You don't even need their CV. Get their ideas down. And, honestly, and I would say make sure they're native in the language you want to publish in. That would be the one bias I would well, say that I come fiber. across a lot, well, is you want them to be a really, you want them to be a good writer. 
I and not have grammar mistakes. You I don't think so? That. No. Okay. And the thing no. about hiring journalists to do your content marketing, and, you know, there are very few journalists out there compared to the amount of companies and startups and PR agency you want to hire journalists. We could be making a shitload more money doing other <laughs> things, trust yeah. me. But as a journalist, you tend to believe in certain things that don't mix well with working for one single company or group of companies, right? So, so you might be have careful. to sell You yourself. might have to learn it yourself, as Ben mentioned. And there are so many resources available. How to learn storytelling, how to write. And the best way to learn writing is by writing, right? So, you and know, you should ask Intercom. Just do it yourself as long as you can. And then hire the best you can. And network. Ask the Intercom, write to Intercom and say, I love your bloggers. Where'd you get them from? They may be the best way to find that one. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. I want to thank our panel, uh, Ben Rooney, Jennifer Riggins, Robin Waters, and I'm Scott Mackin. And uh, yeah, great first day at four years from now. Let's go watch Mark Zuckerberg uh, from Facebook. And get some beer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Well done. <laughs>